Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the definition of a group. Okay, so we're in the process of going through the axioms that the composition law uh, must obey in order for this to be considered a group. So when we construct a group, the first thing we do is create a set of symbols, which we've done here. Okay, we then want to define this composition law on that set of symbols. And in order to be considered a group, uh, the composition law has to obey a bunch of axioms, basically. Okay, the first one is uh, quite simple to understand. That that's closure, okay, and that means that all of the answers in this composition table, all of the entries, have to be from your original group, basically, okay, so that's what closure means. Uh, the second is the most subtle to understand, the most difficult to understand, which is why I've spent so long discussing it, okay, it is associativity, and this basically is about, if you want to compose three things together, okay, there are these two different ways of doing it two different ways where that you can put the brackets, basically, okay, and associativity says that the answer you will get um, is exactly the same between these two, and that is not trivial at all when you think in terms of an abstract composition table like so. Okay, I've then told you how you can actually create uh, a composition law that actually obeys associativity, because it's not easy at all. If you just make up the entries here, you will not end up getting a composition law that obeys associativity. So a way that you can do it is by thinking of the elements of your group, thinking of the symbols in your group as representing permutations of some set, and to give an example here, I've imagined using the set of just two elements, A and B here, and we've got these two set permutations here, which I've given names. Here's the identity set permutation, and here's the transposition set permutation. I've then put these two symbols into a set on their own, Okay, and this is the set which I'm going to use to define the composition law, basically. Okay, and I've now defined composition law on this set here, and the composition law is just basically which set permutation do you end up with when you compose the two set permutations together. So, an arbitrary little x composed with an arbitrary little y means firstly do the set permutation y, and then do the set permutation x. Combine them together. What's the net set permutation that you've got? That needs to be uh, your answer, basically. And in this case, we've only got two possible set permutations uh, of uh, this set containing a and b. So we're assured that whenever we compose any of these two together, any combination of these two together, we'll always end up with one of these back again, basically. How could we not? There are no other set permutations, okay? And whenever you compose one set permutation with another, you must get another set permutation back again. Okay, right. So I've told you that that's the best way of thinking about uh, what the elements of a group really are. They're representing set permutations of some set. And in fact, there is a theorem that says that you can always, always think of the elements of a group as representing uh, the permutations of some set. So this is the best way of uh, thinking of groups, in my opinion, and the best way of actually building a group if you want to go about doing it. Okay, right. So what I now want to show you is how uh, you can think of the integers, this thing that we are using as an example of a group, and I appreciate that we haven't been through all the axioms that a group has to obey yet, but the integers under addition is a group, and we'll see that later on, okay? So it does obey associativity. So how can we think of the integers as representing set permutations, okay? What set are they representing set permutations of? Well, let me just discuss that with you. Okay, right. So we have got the integers, which is this set containing 0, plus 1, negative 1, plus 2, negative 2, plus 3, negative 3, etc. Okay, and we have a composition law uh, on this set of integers, which is the composition law of addition. Okay, and uh, this set with that composition law does in fact uh, obey the axioms of group theory. Okay, and one of those, of course, is associativity. Right, so can we think of these elements here as representing the set permutations of some set? Well, you can. Okay, so let me show you how you can do this. Okay, so what I want you to do is imagine the number line. Okay, so I'll just draw a line out here. Okay, and I want you to imagine a bunch of discrete points on that number line equally spaced. Okay, so I'll put one here, okay, then we'll have another here, 
another here. You could give these points numbers if you want. I don't want to do that because it might confuse you. Okay, well, actually, maybe I should just do it. Okay, so we could give this point zero. The problem is that I'm going to end up giving it the same symbols as the symbols of the group here, and that's why I don't really want to do this. But you can imagine these as the discrete points of the number line, basically, the integers of the number line, plus one, negative one, two, negative two, but I want you to understand that although these are the same symbols as we've got up here, the symbols here are be going to represent something very different. This is the set that we are going to define set permutations on, basically, and the symbols here are going to be representing set permutations of this set. Okay, right, so imagine this discrete lattice here going on and on, and I'll stop using the symbols from now on. That's just to try and get the point across that this is a discrete lattice of points uh, in one dimension, basically, where they're equally spaced apart. Okay, right, so now this is the set that I'm going to take set permutations of. Okay, so this is the set that is analogous to this set containing A and B, basically. Okay, so what are the set permutations of this set that are represented by each of the symbols in my group here of integers under addition? Okay, well, firstly, let me define what zero is going to be. Zero is going to be the map, which is the identity map, basically. So let me draw this out. Okay, so I'll draw the set back again now, and now I'll abandon putting these symbols on. Okay, because I don't want it, you to confuse these symbols here with these symbols here. They're representing a very different thing. These were just uh, symbols for these points in this set, basically. Okay, right, so here's the set back again. Now, zero in this set of integers, or this group of integers under addition, can represent the set permutation where every point goes to itself, basically. Okay, so this set permutation here. So it's the identity map, basically. Okay, so that's what you can think of zero as representing. So this symbol here is representing this set permutation here. Okay, so that's all good. Uh, now let's think of what plus one is going to represent. Well, plus one, the set permutation that you can think of plus one as representing is the set permutation which moves all the points one to the right, basically. Okay, so I might actually even try and show this on the same picture rather than drawing them all out. So I'll color code this. So these are the, this is the set permutation corresponding to zero here. Okay, now let me put on the set permutation corresponding to plus one, and I'll color this in. So we'll have plus one represented in blue here. It's going to represent the set permutation where everything's moved one to the right, basically, like so. Okay, so all of these points are going to be moved one to the right, like so. Okay, and then you can continue this on. So plus two will represent the set permutation where you move everything two to the right rather than one to the right. Plus three will represent the set permutation where you move everything three to the right, okay, etc, etc. So this is plus one shown here where we've just moved everything one to the right. Plus two would then be more extreme, it would move everything two to the right, like so. Okay, so I might just put a few of the plus twos on, so this would be a plus two uh, arrow here, okay, so I'll colour that one in in orange. Um, and you could go on and on, basically, okay? So then you'd have plus three, and I'll put one plus three one on again as well. Okay, so here's plus three in turquoise here. Okay, so that's all the positive numbers now sorted. They represent moving all the points of this set to the right by a certain amount. So you might be able to guess now what the negative numbers are going to represent. They're going to represent moving everything to the left. Okay, uh, so negative 1 will mean move everything to the left by 1, so it can be this purple arrow here. Okay, so I've again only showed it for one point here, but you'd really want it on every single point. Negative 2 will mean move everything to the left by 2, negative 3 will mean move everything to the left by 3. Okay, so that's how you can think of all of these symbols as representing set permutations of this massive great set, this infinite set of points, basically, uh, on this one-dimensional line. Okay, right. Now, how then does addition represent composition of these two? Well, let's just do a few examples and then hopefully you'll be able to see that. So if I take 
2, and I compose it with 3. If I add 2 to 3, that obviously gives me 5, just from basic classical algebra. Hopefully you know that. Okay. Let's think of that now in terms of the composition of these set permutations. Well, 2, the set permutation, well, actually, let's do it the way I've told you to. So, uh, what this means then is do 3 and then do 2. Okay, so 3 will move every point 3 to the right. Okay, and then if you follow that by 2, okay, if you do 3 first and then 2 afterwards, which is what this tells you to do in terms of composing set permutations together, then you'll move everything 2 to the right after that. And what will that overall do? It will move everything 5 to the right. And hence, uh, we have uh, these two composed together is equal to 5. It's They compose together to give the mapping 5. Okay, right. Uh, let's do another example just to get this uh, through. So if we compose 2 with negative 2 this time, okay, we know that that will give us 0. Okay, so firstly that means do the mapping negative 2. The mapping negative 2 will move everything to the left by 2. Okay, so all the points will be moved 2 to the left. Okay, then we follow that by 2, where every point is moved 2 to the right. And of course, that overall has the effect of doing nothing. It sends everything to itself, and therefore it reduces it back to 0, the identity map, basically. Okay, and you can play around with that more if you like. So that's how you can think of the integers as representing set permutations of a set, basically. And this composition law addition as representing these, uh, this composition of uh, set permutations together, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so that's that. Uh, now what I want to do, just to finish associativity off, I want to tell you how associativity extends. So I've told you about the composition of three things. I've told you about how if we have x composed with y composed with z, that has an answer, basically, one answer, and it does not matter where you put the brackets, basically, okay? If your composition law obeys associativity, then that has one answer, it doesn't matter where you put the brackets, okay? This extends, basically. I can put something else on here, I can put composed with you, I can turn it into the composition of four things, and again, this has only one answer, it does not matter where you put the brackets. So, for instance, if I actually wanted to work this out practically with the composition table, I would have to reduce this into just composing two things at once. So for instance, I could put the brackets like so, okay? I could say that this is firstly work out what x composed with y is, and work out what z composed with u is, and then take those two answers and compose them together. Alternatively, I could put the brackets like so, x composed with y composed with z, and then compose with u, which means first compose x with y, get an answer, compose that with z, and then take that answer and compose it with u. Okay. As soon as associativity of three things, the composition of three things holds true, this instantly holds true. Okay. So you don't have to set this as a separate condition. Once you've got uh, the associativity of three things, then you can prove that associativity of an arbitrary strip length string of elements composed with one another uh, holds true, basically. So these two are the same, basically. And the composition of an arbitrary string of things has one answer. It does not matter where you put the brackets. Now, I'm not going to prove that because it's quite a tricky little proof to get your head around, okay? And in an introductory video on group theory, I don't want people to get lost with that proof, okay? Hopefully it should be intuitively obvious when you remember back to the uh, understanding of elements of a group as representing permutations of sets, and the composition as representing the composition of those set permutations, okay? Then it should be pretty obvious that if you just have four mappings following one another, then that has one answer, and therefore it doesn't matter how you group together uh, two things being composed together, basically. Okay, right, so it doesn't matter where you put the brackets. So that's just something I want to say, that associativity, once you've got associativity of the composition of three things, you can prove from that that you can have an arbitrary length string of elements composed together, and it does not matter where you put the brackets, basically. It has one answer. 
OK, right. Uh, so that's associativity finally finished. OK, so let's now move on to the other axioms of group theory. And there are two more that we have to cover, but they won't take us as long as associativity. Associativity, as I say, is the most complicated to get your head around. It's the one that is most important for you to understand how non-trivial it is. OK, and really it's the foundations of all that algebra is about, really. OK, right. So, let's now go on to axiom number three, and I don't know why I've suddenly started using Roman numerals. Okay, so axiom number three is that the group needs to contain what is known as an identity element, and I'll just move this up a little bit. Okay, so you need an identity element. Okay, now, the identity element is just a symbol within the set which has special properties. Okay, and it's often denoted E, or I, or 0, or 1. OK, depending on your scenario, you can see the identity element denoted as all of those, basically, in different cases. OK, right, so what is the identity element? Well, the identity element is an element which composes with all other elements of the group, so an arbitrary other element of the group, to give just that arbitrary element of the group back again. And it does not matter whether you compose uh, the identity element on the left or on the right of this arbitrary element. So in equation form, what this means is that I'll denote my identity element as E. If I take E composed with little g, where little g is an arbitrary element of my group, OK, so an arbitrary element of my set here, so any element of my set, uh, then that will just give that arbitrary element of the group back again. And also, because we don't necessarily have commutativity, which means we don't necessarily have the x composed with y is equal to y composed with x, I also need to put the g composed with little e is equal to little g. So if you compose it on the right, like so, it again uh, just gives that arbitrary element of the group back again. OK, right. So more intuitively, what does that mean? OK, well, if I draw my composition table out, OK, it means that I'm going to have one element, which is little e here, OK? And basically, if we have all the other elements of g here, OK, so all the other elements of g here, and we'll have all the element, other elements of g here, then if I have an arbitrary little g in my um, group, then if I compose little g um, with e, let's do this one first, little g with e, then that means take little g from here, okay, take e from here, okay, that basically means that I will get little g back again for all little g is an element of big g, and that includes the identity here, so when I compose the identity with the identity, I must get the identity. So whatever element you take from this side of the table here and compose with E, you will just get that little element back again. So all of the entries in this column here are just going to be the entries from here translated over to here, basically. So this column here is just going to be a repeat of this column here, basically, is what that says about the composition table. In addition, this portion here says that if we take E here and compose that with an arbitrary element from our group here, again, it has to give that arbitrary element of the group back again. So it says that this row here is just going to have all the same um, values or elements as we have up here. So effectively, that row is just this row moved down or copied and moved down, basically. OK. Right, so that's what it means in terms of the composition table, that you're going to have some element which has these nice rows and columns associated with it. OK. More intuitively, in my opinion, we should think back to thinking of the elements of our group as representing permutations of sets. That's always where you should go back to. It's the most intuitive way of thinking about what groups are. Okay? What then does it mean that we need to have an identity? Well, basically, it means that one of the set permutations that you have represented by a symbol in your group must be the identity permutation. Okay? So, going back to our two examples that we've seen, this here it had the identity permutation represented by i here. And you will notice that i composed with any element 
of the group, albeit there are only two of them, okay, one of which is the identity anyway, but you can see that it composed with any elements of the group, either on the left or on the right, okay, to give just that element of the group back again, basically, okay, uh, so you can see that this row is indeed, this row here just moved down, and this column here is indeed just this column here moved along here, okay, so this is our um, identity of this group here, and indeed this does form a group, this composition table this set. Okay, right, so we had this identity permutation represented by a symbol here. Now, why does the identity map always compose with any other map to give that other map back again? Well, simply the identity map just carries everything to itself, so when you compose it with another permutation, such as the transposition, it just leaves that, it means that the net the permutation is just that other permutation, basically. In this case, it's just the transposition. Okay, so if we look at these two examples where we have composed the identity permutation on either side with transposition, it just leaves them the same because it just maps everything to itself and it doesn't therefore change what you've already done or what you're about to do, basically. Okay, uh, so that's why having this uh, results in these fancy um, rows and columns in the composition table, okay, why the identity map will compose with any other map, just to give that other map back again, basically. Okay, in the examples of thinking about the integers as um, uh, s representing step permutations of a set, zero is obviously representing the identity uh, map here. It maps everything onto itself, and we know, of course, that zero adds to any integer just to give that integer back again. Okay, and again, that's true whatever side you put zero on, basically. Okay, right. So that's the third axiom of group theory, that you need to have the identity map represented within your group. So you need to have some symbol representing the identity permutation of your set. So when you're building a group, you uh, start by thinking about permutations of some set, okay? Uh, as long as you always think in terms of permutations of this set, you will automatically get associativity, but you need to make sure that one of the symbols that you're going to use in your group is that identity map, basically, is representing that identity map. Okay, that's one of the conditions of group theory. Okay, we'll have a break here, and then in the final video, we'll talk about the final axiom of group theory, which is that we need inverse elements.